Today, we take a look at Promontory Summit behind the scenes. This is Railroad Showcase. These are constructed in the 1970s uh, in Costa Mesa, California by O'Connor Engineering Laboratories. Uh, the idea was to have running replicas out here at the site and they were delivered in time for the 110th anniversary, uh, 1979. Uh, they're built to within a quarter of an inch of accuracy. Uh, the way they're painted is historically accurate, as close as we can get based on the latest research. Um, all the brass, all the gold leafing is, was pretty standard at the time. So the way you see them today is as close as we can get you to the real deal uh, back in 1869. Um, so originally the park um, was kind of made into a National Historic Site in 1957. Um, and that was by the, the Secretary of Interior. Um, so it wasn't part of the National Park Service at that time. It was just kind of designated as a site and there wasn't much out here except a big um, obelisk. Uh, in 1965 is when Congress uh, passed enabling legislation which made it part of the National Park Service um, under the Department of Interior. Um, 69, of course, was our, our big centennial that took place out here. And uh, a lot of people that I have talked to since I've been here were here in 69 and they're planning to come out um, for the 150th. So, so it'll be interesting to see you know, what their impressions are between the two. Um, and then the locomotives came here in 79. Um, it's kind of the other big date for us. Um, and so they just celebrated their 40th birthday last year, last month, last, yeah, last week. <laughs> um, so those two replica locomotives have been here for 40 years. Uh, so out here in uh, 1969, they did have two engines out on the tracks uh, for the 100th anniversary. Uh, those were loaners from the Nevada State Railroad Museum. And it was actually the Nevada State Railroad Museum sort of asking for those back uh, that prompted us to get uh, these running locomotives out here that you see today. Uh, so they were out here, I believe, until 78, and then they were taken back to Nevada State. But they sat out in the elements, unlike these that are pretty pampered and have a garage to live in, they sort of sat out there all seasons. Um, there's pictures where there's, it looks like a blizzard came through and just kind of coated them over, and there's uh, tarps over the caps to sort of protect them in some way. But um, they were in no way as close and accurate as these engines are. They just sort of were painted up to look like the two. So normally during um, the summertime, the locomotives do operate daily and they come out in the morning, they do a steam demonstration in the middle of the day and then go back to the engine house in the evening. Um, throughout the day, visitors come to the visitor center, they um, see the exhibits, they watch the video. Um, we have one video that plays every half hour um, and we have five others that play on request. Um, in our smaller auditorium. Um, they go out and they visit the last spike site and see the spot where the Transcontinental Railroad was completed. Um, and when the locomotives are there, it's, it's kind of a, a, a ni really nice scene to look at. Um, so you've got the, the last spike site right in between the two locomotives. Uh, so normally we'd get in at eight o'clock, uh, we'd light a fire in the engines first thing, and uh, then start to complete our oil rounds. Uh, there's a whole bunch of different points we have to oil every day, and then there's things we have to oil weekly. So depending on the day of the week it is, you know, depends on how much oil you gotta go through. Um, during that time, we're also building the fire, uh, getting this up to pressure. About 9.30ish, we'll pull the engines out onto the pad here, do last minute things we might have to do. Um, there's a lot of wiping, because uh, they may leave the shop clean every day, but they come back dusty and dirty because there's plenty of dust up here. Um, and then at 10 o'clock, Jupiter will go down the tracks uh, and park down at the last bike site after doing a run up and down. And uh, the 119 uh, will come back and a vehicle pick it up and drive it down because we usually only have uh, enough crew here to run one engine at a time for regular days in the summer. Uh, so we'll run her up and down the siding and then park her at the last bike site and call it good. And then we'll repeat that again at 1 o'clock and at 4 o'clock we'll do the same runs but we'll just bring them back home. Um, we have to hold it at pressure uh, for the next couple days while they're setting up for the big sesquicentennial. We, uh, we're not running because there's a lot of construction going on down there, but we have to maintain enough heat in it so it doesn't cool down and uh, reconstrict the metal 
because uh, when they're hot like this, it only takes about an hour in the morning to get them ready to go again. But if we let it cool down, you're looking at six to eight hours before we can have enough pressure to operate. Air pump is a design of one of the original ones. It was patented in uh, May of 1869. So it's the same time that the ceremony took place. So originally you wouldn't have seen this in 1869 on the 119 or on the Jupiter. Um, but we want to stop when we want to stop. So use of air brakes is sort of important on that. Uh, so what you're seeing here is a, one of the first models of a Westinghouse air pump. And if you read historical articles on it and how, how much of a pain it was and how, what kind of issues they had back then, we're still encountering those issues. So we must be somewhat accurate on this pump because it doesn't always want to work for us. Um, in fact, uh, two years ago, we had an issue where just the reversing rod got bent just, just slightly and it didn't want to circulate, it didn't want to do any work for us and it put us out for about a month. So there's plenty of fun issues with those. Uh, it's, it's hard to imagine what 15,000 people plus um, is going to look like out here. Those are the numbers we're expecting for May 10th. Um, and even May 11th, we're expecting right around 15,000 people as well. A normal May 10th event, we probably get two to 3,000 people. And even that fills up the grounds in front of where the ceremony takes place. So likely it's gonna be a, a standing room only uh, event. We're, we're encouraging people to bring their own chairs and blankets so they do have a place to sit uh, while they're here. Um, but likely, if you want to see anything, you're likely going to have to stand during the event. <laughs> yeah, I have a lot of good memories from, from working out here. So it's been great to be back and um, to be out here again and see the locomotives. So last week when uh, the 119 came out for the first time for the, the season, you know, it was pretty exciting to, to see that again and hear it and smell it. I haven't gotten to experience that for over 10 years. Uh, so here are our injectors. Uh, we have four of them. Uh, we put two on the engines and then the other two are the ones that we reshop throughout the summer and then we can tag them out and put them right back on the engines, take the old one off and uh, rebuild those. Uh, so these are the ones that ran last year. That's why they look also uh, dingy and dirty and not very presentable. Um, now the 119 was the only engine in 1869 that was actually outfitted with an injector. Rogers, uh, when they built this, it was sort of state of the art for 1868. So there were a lot of things that it had that other engines didn't necessarily have. Um, for example, Jupiter didn't have an injector at the time. She only had crosshead pumps as a means of getting water into the boiler. However, today uh, you have to have at least two methods of getting water into the boiler. So we hide an injector up in Jupiter's cab. So that way from the ground, she still looks historically accurate to a point. Um, but we can still then inject water into the boiler, which works for us because we stand still for so long for much of the day that crosshead pumps, it, it doesn't really work out too well for us. Uh, you can see the murals on it. Uh, the one over here is of Patterson Falls in Patterson, New Jersey. And back when I was an interp ranger, I'd point that out to people. And I actually had a group uh, from Patterson, New Jersey in my tour group, and they looked at it and said, well, that does look like it. So. Uh, the artist did a good job capturing that. And then the mural on the other side, a lot of people say looks like the Tetons or a mountain range in the west. And so here on the back, you sort of have the east meeting the west on this engine as the Union Pacific is going from the east to meet up with the west. Um, and a lot of people ask, is, is that accurate or did you just doll it up because, you know, it was famous. But that's originally what they had on the engine. You can see pictures of those murals. Um, it kind of blows people's mind when you see that and all the gold leaf in and realize 119 was designed to haul freight, not necessarily passengers. So the, the level of artistry they put into these engines, even though they weren't going to haul people, was kind of insane. Yeah, yeah, they did it different back then. Mm -hmm. It was all about attracting the eye, a uh, form of advertisement. We do have a gentleman, Jim Ingram, that comes out from California every year and uh, touches up the gold leafing for us. He was out here two weeks ago. Um, so he helps us out with that because finding someone who can gold leaf is, you know, it's an art form that's uh, not as widely well known anymore. Yeah, it's, uh, I think it's a pretty awesome place that you can really immerse yourself in the history. I mean, there aren't many places um, along even where the railroad grade goes now that is the original grade that was being used um, in 1869. You can, you can stand there right on the site and also you look around you and 
it looks exactly the same as it did in 1869. There might be a few ranch buildings around that weren't here at the time, but the landscape looks exactly the same. There aren't a bunch of housing complexes around. There's no office buildings surrounding us. Um, so it's, it's a really unique experience to be able to come out here and, and see that and um, really get into the history. So, so we hope that people, when they come out here, that they're able to experience is not only just to see the site, but really start to understand, you know, what happened out here, why it was such a big deal. I mean, we just, we completed the railroad um, across the country, and now instead of taking six months to go from the East Coast to the West Coast, um, you could do it in a week. All right, everybody, thanks for joining us. We are glad you're here. Coming up on Friday, we've got some favorite finds from the internet, and next week we are going to go back to Ogden and look at more of what happened with the big boy. Thank you guys again so much for watching. Make sure that you're either subscribed or joined to our Facebook group, Railroad Showcase RPO, so you don't miss anything. And if you enjoyed watching this video, consider giving it a thumbs up. Thanks for being here. Keep your hand on the throttle and your eye on the rail.